Believe it or not, there's a fairly long list of people who have survived their executions. We might look at the case of William Duell, a 17-year-old English boy who was hanged in 1740 in London and then came back to life as he was about to be dissected. He was later exiled to North America. Then you had John Babacombe Lee, another Englishman nicknamed the man they couldn't hang after surviving three executions. More recently, you have the case of Romel Broom, an American man sentenced to death by lethal injection. He survived that ended up writing a book called Survivor on Death Row, but it seems he spoke too early, as he's scheduled for another execution in 2020. But today we'll talk about one of the best known survivor stories in this episode of the Infographics Show, Death Row Inmate Who Survived His Own Execution. As we've said, a handful of people have survived their executions. You can read quite recent cases too, such as American inmate Doyle Lee Ham, who was said to have experienced torturous and traumatic hours in the execution chamber before staff admitted that they had failed. The US media reported in 2017 that a man called Alva Campbell became the third man to survive an execution in the country in recent decades, and that was just a matter of the execution team not being able to find a vein in which to inject the lethal drugs. But perhaps the tale we're about to tell you now is the most moving, as the person that survived was only 17 years old. It's also the first case of someone surviving the electric chair in the USA. If you've seen our show on Old Sparky, you'll know that executions in the early days could certainly be horrific to watch, but eventually the inmates succumbed to the shock. That was not the case for 17-year-old Willie Francis. Let's have a look at what events led to him ending up in the chair. Francis was a young, poor African American in 1946, and at the time of his lucky escape, many people believed that the hand of God had interrupted this macabre spectacle of official murder. For one thing, he was just so young, and a lot of people decreed the execution of a boy not yet a man. And another thing was the fact that the American justice system at the time could have been said to be harsh for certain people of certain races and certain social standing. He lived in a place called St. Martinville, located in southwestern Louisiana. You can read articles about this place in in the 40s with one saying that the town had two sections, one for the white people and the other for the colored. The white tended to their own business and the colored tend to theirs. Yes, this was a time when racism was pervasive in some parts of the US, and despite the backwards attitudes of some people, there was a lot of support for young Willie when he was condemned to death. After the botched execution attempt, Francis wrote from his prison cell, A lot of people write me to ask me to tell them something about what I did when I was young. I'm only 18 now, so I guess they mean when I was very young. But what had he done? One of 13 children, Francis said life was hard as a kid, but he wrote he had fond memories of the hard knock life, playing baseball with a broomstick handle and going out with friends causing mischief. When he got older, he was given a job by a man called Andrew Thomas. Thomas owned the local drugstore, hiring Francis to do errands and keep the store tidy. They apparently got along and Francis was called a nice boy and cooperative by folks who visited the store. He was, however, called illiterate by some, or at least close to that. Others said he was slow, but later when Francis was writing for from his prison cell, it was proven that he could not just write, but express himself in a deep and meaningful way. We're telling you this because this case was very controversial, and at the time and for years after, people tried to understand why this seemingly nice kid committed a murder. That murder was of the drugstore owner, Thomas. When her son was convicted of slaying his boss, the mother told the press, there wasn't no bad in him, I just don't understand. Quite a few people thought that this young boy, perhaps somewhat mentally challenged, had admitted guilt to something he didn't do, the murder of Andrew Thomas, described as a handsome, educated bachelor with his own successful business. He was killed at his home during that night of November 7, 1944. His body was discovered the next day, splayed on the floor near the house steps. Two witnesses, Alvin and Ida Van Brocklin, had said that they heard gunshots in the night. They didn't see who did the firing, though. It was later said that Thomas had been dining with friends and upon returning home had been met by a gunman who unloaded five bullets in him. Two hit him in the back, two in his left side, and one went right through his eye. It said his pockets had been emptied, prompting police to say the reason for the murder was robbery. Rumors spread around town. It said he was quite the ladies' man, and many speculated he had been killed by one of those ladies' husbands or lovers. For months, people believed this to be the case. Sometime later, police were looking for a drug dealer, and it said that Willie Francis just happened to see the police. He wasn't dealing drugs, but it said that when he saw the two white police officers running his way, he just took off out of fright. That was a mistake, as running made the police think that he was guilty of something. Later, Francis was interviewed by cops at the police station. They said he seemed frightened and he stuttered a lot, but it turned out that Francis had stuttered his whole life. The cops didn't think that they had captured a drug dealer that they had been looking for, but guess what they found on Francis? They found Andrew Thomas's wallet and identification card. 
That's what they said anyway. It said that within three to five minutes the police got a full confession for the murder of Thomas. They also managed to get a confession for an unrelated assault and robbery in another town. The facts cops did this in a few minutes, and the fact that the boy was said to be somewhat slow would compel people to ask if the interrogation and subsequent confessions were perhaps a part of a setup. Francis was questioned without a lawyer, without any advice, without any family member or friend being present. The confession read, I, Willie Francis, now 16 years old, I stole the gun from Mr. Ogasey at St. Martinville, Louisiana, and kill Andrew Thomas November 9, 1944, or about that time at St. Martinville, Louisiana. It was a secret about me and him. I took a black purse with card 1280182 in it, $4 in it. He wrote a second confession the next day. This one contained more details about how many shots had been fired and where the body was found. As for the trial, it said Francis' lawyers were inept. One writer says they never questioned for indictment, nor did they make a motion for change of venue, despite the widespread publicity about the murder of a beloved white member of a small community by a black youth. The twelve white jurors found him guilty, and he was to be executed. Francis' lawyers never challenged the verdict. By the way, Francis has pleaded not guilty. The jury never heard any argument pertaining to the possibility of a forced confession or that evidence could have been planted. The confession itself was good enough for him to be convicted. Many people in the town thought that something smelled funny as did many others across the U.S. The local press wrote, quote, Throughout the trial, the Negro was uninterested and showed very little emotion." Unquote. Francis wrote that he was concerned that he might act like a crybaby on the day of his execution, but was relieved to hear that the actual execution would only tickle. On May 3, 1946, he had his head shaved and prepared to have 2,500 volts of electricity flow through him. On his cell wall, it was discovered that he had written the words, Of course I am not a killer. Police never did have a motive for the murder, nor any substantial evidence other than the confession of a slow 16-year-old boy. He was taken to Louisiana State Penitentiary in Angola to be put in the chair, nicknamed Gruesome Gertie. The lever was pulled, and this is how Francis later described the feeling. I couldn't stop the jumping. If that was tickling, it sure was a funny kind. I thought for a minute I was going to knock the chair over. Then I was all right. I thought I was dead. Other reports state that he shouted, take it off, take it off, as the executioners tried to give him a second round of shocks. It's said that after the failed attempt, he wasn't even injured, but he said he felt kind of dizzy. Some people said this was a miracle, and a righteous one as they didn't believe that he was guilty nor had had a fair trial. Louisiana's governor James Davis then said in six days they would send him to the chair again. That didn't happen, and much of America got behind the young man. He once wrote, I felt just like a movie star. I didn't have any idea I had so many friends. He also later described how his execution felt, and something he called the chair. He wrote, you feel like you got a mouthful of cold peanut butter, and you see little blue and pink and green speckles, the kind that shines in a rooster's tail. What ensued were many months of legal arguments. Not only did some people believe he wasn't even, but lawyers now argued that to subject a person to a second execution was cruel and unusual punishment. Prosecution lawyers argued against that, stating the first attempt had not worked at all and he had not been hurt. But the evidence supporting this in hindsight seems pretty weak. The court also heard that the botch was just an accident, and such accidents happen for which no man is to blame. That meant no one was at fault, and there should be another execution. We might also note that later the state was petitioned with lawyers stating this about the botched execution. The scene was a disgraceful and inhuman exhibition, that as soon as the switch controlling the current was taken off, the drunken executioner cursed Francis and told him he would be back to finish electrocuting him, and if the electricity did not kill him, he would kill him with a rock. The drunken men in charge that night were accused of being sadistic, not giving Francis the full shock because they wanted to torture him. He was then returned to the chair on May 9, 1947, and this time he didn't survive. He was just 18 years old. If anything positive came out of all of this, it's the fact that the justice system was exposed for not supporting Francis in the first place. This poor black boy may or may not have killed his boss, but he certainly wasn't protected as he should have been by the American justice system. Many Americans of all colors saw and criticized what had happened. After hearing the strange and perhaps infuriating case of young Willie Francis, we'd like to get your opinion. Tell us in the comments. Also, be sure to check out our other show, Man So Violent Even Other Prisoners Fear Him. Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.